represented uh, Roger Stone. But before we even talk about <laughs> your, <laughs> Roger Stone and the accolades and your career, I know that you're the son of a, of a bookkeeper and I know that you are from Miami Beach, but could you tell us a little bit about your life before becoming Bruce Rogo Esquire? Well, I grew up originally in Connecticut and moved to Florida when I was 16 and uh, graduated from Miami Beach High School. Uh, by the way, Luke graduated from Miami from Beach High School. That indeed. was a coincidence that I, I didn't know <laughs> at the beginning. And, uh, and then went to the University of Miami and then went to law school at the University of Florida. Uh, and that was, I graduated in 1963. And uh, I passed the bar in 64. And then that, that part of my life, the past 56 years, began then in 1964. <laughs> So uh, it was fun growing up on the beach. It was very different from Connecticut. And at that time, it was a very small universe of people, and there were only two causeways. So we didn't even have that much uh, interaction with Greater Miami. 56 um, amazing years. Uh, I've talked many times about your profound influence on so many attorneys um, locally and throughout the country and what you've meant to jurisprudence and what you've meant to me, um, having the opportunity to sit at the table and learn from you. And I've talked a lot about uh, your role in providing and helping us achieve a better America, but just a little bit more about your background. Do you have children? Are you married? I do. I'm married. In fact, my wife is just bringing me something to drink while we're talking. Uh, Jacqueline, <laughs> who is a graduate of Nova Southeastern University, uh, she's a lawyer also. So uh, we have three children. Uh, Bryce, who's the oldest, uh, graduated from Princeton, went to Iraq, was a uh, medic with a Marine Reconnaissance Battalion. Thank you for your service, Iraq. Bryce. And now he lives in, uh, in Southern California. And Brooks, uh, second child, lives in Asheville, not far from where we are now. And Alina, my daughter, uh, got a master's in African economics at uh, the London School of Economics. And then she's working in Seattle. So uh, we've traveled a lot, traveled a lot with them all over the world. I think that's really been helpful to them in terms of their appreciation uh, for the world and its difficulties and its pleasures. You must be very proud, Bruce. You have an amazing family indeed. So, well, I don't know. One of them, one of, one of them is not doing everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I read a story and I wanted to lead off uh, with, with the story. Um, I know you are tremendously integral um, in changing the South. And I've mentioned many times that not only are you this amazing attorney that everyone has heard of, but that locally we need to understand the role that you have played in changing our rights and changing the liberties in, in the South and who Bruce Rogo has meant to the change. And I read this story that I wanted to, to, to lead off with and it talks about you leaving a restaurant um, being chased by an angry crowd and asking uh, the police officers for help. And then when the police officers finally <laughs> intervened, they arrested you and not necessarily the persons who were, were pursuing you and you even had your car overturned uh, in the parking lot. And how did you feel at, at that time? I know I'm asking you to go back many years, Bruce, but what did you feel at that moment? Well, you know, it was a strange thing. We were having dinner at Shoney's Restaurant in Jackson's, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, Mother's Day, 1965. And it was myself, uh, a woman who was a SNCC worker, a, a civil rights worker, a black woman, and another white lawyer. And we were approached by four or five uh, early 20-year-old boys and uh, they started harassing us. And to the credit of the manager at Shoney's, he shooed them away. And he told them, he said, leave these people alone. They're just having their dinner, uh, get out of here. And so we finished our dinner, paid the check, walked outside. I had a little triumph uh, at the time. And 
and Gwen and Bill and I got in the car, and all of a sudden we were surrounded by two cars which contained these kids who had harassed us in the restaurant. And I went back in, and I, I said to the manager, I said, we need to call the police. And so he, said, he gave me the phone, we called the police, and the police came, and then they saw it was me. And there were only two or three civil rights lawyers in Jackson at the time, so they knew who I was. And as soon as they saw that it was me, they turned off their lights and they drove away, leaving us in the car no. trying to figure out what to do. Ferris Street was the main street where our office was, the main street in the black community. So uh, I said, let's get in the car. I think I can outrun them. And these two cars then followed us and began throwing things at us, uh, throwing bottles and things at us. And I ran a red light because I saw a police van and uh, blowing my horn. They stopped at the light. And then when I got out of my car and I ran over to the police van, the police officer said, you're under arrest. I said, what for? Now, I knew I ran a red light. I said, what for? And he said, for resisting your own death. Well, you know, it was so weird that and it was so strange that, that truthfully, I, I kind of laughed at it. It was so absurd. And But then he said, get in the back of the van. And that's when I was sort of frightened because I didn't know what would happen in the back of a, of a police van in Jackson. But anyway, they opened the door, pushed me in the van, and there was an old white guy sitting there and he was drunk and he said are we going to memphis i said no we're going to jail and uh, so we went to jail gwen and bill drove my car parked it in front of the police station and then the elevator on the way up to the booking office the police officers didn't touch me but they called me every name you could think of uh, and then they went to book me and i looked out the window and there was my car upside down uh in front of the in front of the police station in jackson and I said, you know, you can deny everything else, but no, no tornado came through town. You can't deny that somebody turned over my car. My car. And so I, I'll ask you this, Bruce, and I'm not engaging in hyperbole, but being taken into the back of that police car, was there a moment in which you questioned whether you would make it back home at all? Were you, were... That, that was the scariest moment. There's no question. You, you, you don't know what's inside. And of course, we've had stories about people being harmed in police vans. And uh, so that was the scariest. And in the elevator, uh, that was scary, too. But they didn't touch me. But uh, yeah, that, that was, that was the, uh, the, the most uh, challenging moment, I think. There were other times I got chased by the Klan and I had to go back to court and ask the U.S. Marshals to follow me out of town, things like that. But you know, I was young. I was, what, 24, 25? And, and part of me was thinking, how can this be? You know, this makes no sense at all that, that people would threaten your life. But of course, Schwerner, Goodman, Goodman and Cheney had been killed a few months before, Absolutely. just before I got there. So I knew that these kind of things posed real threats. So I'll, I'll ask you this in the most recent context that we've seen the videos and heard the complaints and watched the news. There have been reports of um, persons who've been um, arrested by police officers who are in unmarked cars, unmarked vans. People have been taken into vans from uh, protests. Your experience that you just described, does that inform the way you look at the news and what you think about the episodes that you may see? Well, what, what's troubling is, is that, is that in many ways things have not changed in terms of how, how police officers sometimes react uh, in, in situations. But, but I don't think that, that it really, hold, hold on a second. Hello, hello. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that that it uh, it really changes how I view these things. I mean, each of these incidents are are unacceptable. Having been there a little bit, but never really suffered the kind of damage that people have suffered. Uh, I know the fear. I mean, you know, it. Uh, you know, I I was driving while white, but I was driving while white as a civil rights lawyer. Absolutely. Uh, in that community in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, where I was, uh, people people have a little different view of me. So I, I, I can empathize with with feeling that that distress when a police officer uh, approaches you. You know, I, I've read also and um, in doing some research about you many, many years ago about just how 
firm you were to certain principles. And I will tell you an interesting story, um, Bruce. I would say it has to be at least 10 years ago. Another lawyer and I were talking about you. And we were discussing some of the cases that you've taken. And I remember her telling me that at first it was so difficult for her to understand. She says, Ken, I couldn't understand at first because I'm Jewish. And I thought, how could Bruce Rogo <laughs> take some of these, um, of, these, of these cases? And I told her, I said, I had the greatest respect for you because of something my father told me. He said, a principled man lives by principles. Um, and those principles mean a lot to him. Um, and, I, and, and I remember the story of you taking a job with the ADL, but leaving the ADL because I think the ADL wanted to prohibit what they had considered to be a neo-Nazi from making a speech and you were an advocate for First Amendment. Can you, can, can you speak a little bit to that experience? Yeah, that that was interesting. I mean, I the the ADL, which was an ad, which is an admirable admirable organization, absolutely uh, hired me. That was that was early in early in 1964 because I left there after uh, in July or so, and I'll tell you how, how that led me to Mississippi actually. So, you know, I, I thought that some of their principles were were uh, negated by their myopic view of the First Amendment. So if people spoke things that they liked, uh, then fine. But if they spoke things that they didn't like, hate speech, those kind of things, which certainly is intolerable, but it's protected, uh, they didn't like it. And so I was frustrated. And the fellow who was my boss then, his name was Brant Coopersmith, he said, you know, he said, I don't think this is for you. He said, why don't you go down to Atlantic City, which is near Philadelphia, where I was working, and uh, and go to the convention, see what's happening at the Democratic Convention was there. And that's really what, what started me. I obviously had, had civil rights uh, uh, interests, and I met Fannie Lou Hamer. And I don't know if all of your listeners know who Fannie Lou Hamer was, but Fannie Lou Hamer was the leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, mm -hmm. seeking to unseat the Mississippi white Democrats who had historically discriminated against African Americans in uh, in Mississippi. And so I began to hang out with the folks that were Freedom Democratic Party people. And Mrs. Hamer said to me, she said, you're a lawyer. She said, we need lawyers uh, in Mississippi. We need people to do this kind of work. And, uh, and that, when I left the convention, I went back to Philadelphia, I quit my job, I drove out to Detroit where a guy named George Crockett, who was a, a wonderful black lawyer who was heading the National Lawyers Guild, I said, I'd like to go to Mississippi. There were only two programs, his program, National Lawyers Guild, actually the NAACP Legal Defense, Defense Fund had a program, and uh, those are the only two. And he said, he said, don't join us because we're on the, the subversive list in Florida. And if you ever mm. go back to Florida, you'll have to deal with that. But the ACLU wants to start a program. So go see this fellow in New York. So I turned around in Detroit, drove to New York, met Henry Schwarzschild, he hired me. And so in 1964, I was hired to work with the Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee. And Al Bronstein, who was a few years older than I, a more experienced lawyer, uh, set up the office. I came a couple of weeks later, and that was the beginning of LCDC, Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee. So the ADL experience uh, really led me to something that was more important. Yeah, I, I, so I'll share a funny anecdote with you. I had written a, a motion for summary judgment a few years ago um, on a First Amendment case in which somebody was claiming that uh, she was denied her rights as a Christian um, in, in, in public schools, and I wrote the brief on behalf of uh, the school board, and it was successful. And I will never forget my aunt, who is a Pentecostal Christian, um, telling me just how embarrassed she was that I was celebrating that, st that story, and she she wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> had I lost all morals by becoming <laughs> an attorney. And I told her, you know, the principles are there and the First Amendment is there. And um, it's very hard sometimes when I say to somebody, well, no, the Klan has the right 
uh, to make their speeches in as much as in within the ambit of the law, within the ambit of the First Amendment, in as much as we have the right to oppose within the ambit of the law what they have to say, then certainly the constitutional protections um, are extended to them also. And I know that in, in our correspondence earlier, uh, earlier this week, uh, just going back to the experience with the restaurant and in the South that you had lost someone who had become uh, dear to you as a result of your work in uh, civil rights. Can you tell us who that person is and, and, and how you met? You know, and it's an admixture of, 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 of affection, uh, respect, and ultimately the bottom line is what moved this person, I think, to, <laughs> to recognize the error of his ways. His name was Irv Feldman. And he owned a restaurant in Jackson. And you have to remember, we, we were, there were just a hammer, handful of us lawyers in Jackson and civil rights workers. I mean, they were all throughout the state, but Jackson was a center. And it was called the Old Time Delicatessen. Now, I'm Jewish, and I like bagels, and I like some of the historic food that I was used to. But you couldn't get that in Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, except at the Old Time Delicatessen. And so I went to the old time delicatessen and I said to Irv, you know, we'd like to come here and eat, but we understand that you discriminate. You won't serve black people. And he said, well, he said, you know, I can't, I'm Jewish and, and, and I'm a minority here too. And the Klan can come after me. So I said, look at Irv, there are a whole bunch of us and we're good eaters. And so we'd like to come and eat, uh, but we're not going to come and eat if you discriminate. And it took him a few weeks and he finally came around. Uh, and, uh, and so he finally did come around. He said, I'm desegregated. You can bring whoever you want to eat here. And, and there were a lot of civil rights workers, black civil rights workers who, who had become accustomed to dealing with Jewish people who liked their Jewish food, heard stories about it. And so it became kind of a gathering place. And ultimately, uh, when I was over in Selma and I needed bagels, I would call her and he put bagels on a bus from Jackson to Selma. And nice. I'd go to the bus stop uh, and I could pick up my bagels. Getting the cream cheese was the harder part, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that, was, uh, that was it. And he died. He was 93. He died three or four days ago. Uh, so in I have Jackson, an interesting question. And Professor Rogo may say objection calls for speculation, but do you think he changed? Uh, his mindset because you pointed out to him about lost economic opportunity or was he more persuaded by your conviction to changing the South? I think that he, and I'll tell you one other story that relates to this kind of situation. I think that he was sympathetic. He, he did not like what was going on. On the other hand, you know, his own life, his family, and I say life literally, you know, was threatened by the Ku Klux Klan because he was Jewish. There were very few Jews in Mississippi, although at one time, it's interesting, in Canton, Mississippi, 30 miles north of Jackson, th there were in the downtown center of town, there were 12 stores and seven of them were owned by Jewish merchants uh, who had come, most of them from Eastern Europe and had found their way to the South. Most of them were peddlers. And, uh, and so these stores in downtown Canton were owned by Jewish merchants. And the Canton people respected them so much that on Yom Kippur, uh, which is a, the Day of Atonement That's in right. Jewish uh, uh, theology, and everything closes on Yom Kippur, the whole town, all of the commercial interests in town closed down out of, out of not sympathy, but out of unity. With uh, with the Jewish community, that's how that's how good it was there. Now they had they had other blind spots, obviously, but on that front, there in Canton, it worked. So I think he he was he obviously he wouldn't have changed had he not thought that that it was the right thing to do. But the economics of it, I think, I think and the economics, and I you know I think we had some lightness of being. I mean, we recognized what was going on and I wasn't berating him. I wasn't going to parade in front of his store. Uh, and, uh, and so he came around. And then ultimately, I think a lot of people came around uh, when they realized that, that we, because it, it, was, it was we who he was afraid of, that people would see us eating there and people would then identify him with us and then he would be in Subject to, to the Klan's ridicule and scorn. Right. I mean, it was, it was a real threat, no question about it.
You want to hear another good clan story? Oh, indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> so in Tallulah, Louisiana, and this is a bit, and funny how these stories kind of tie together. In Tallulah, Louisiana, the mayor uh, who ultimately became mayor was a fellow named Zelma Weich. But when I met Zelma Weich, Zelma Weich was a barber in Tallulah, but he was kind of the leader of the black community. And he called me one day and he said 50 people had been arrested uh, for demonstrating in Tallulah. Tallulah, if you look at a map, is due west of, of, uh, uh, of Vicksburg. So you go across the bridge of the Mississippi River. So I went to, to uh, Tallulah and I got there, you know, about five o'clock in the afternoon and the bond was $100 a piece. So there were 50 people, it was $5,000. And the people in Louisiana had some money. Uh, they, they had businesses and so there was a bag full of money, $5 bills, $10 bills, $20 bills. And I had to go to the sheriff to bail out the 50 people. So I get to the sheriff's office and his name was Bruce also. I forget what his last name was, but you know, I thought I'm Bruce, he's Bruce. We have something in common. In common. Well, it was a big mistake <laughs> on my part, but uh, I said, I want, to, I want to bond these people out of jail. He said, it'd be $5,000. I said, here's a bag, I've got it. And he slowly counted out, it must've taken him 20 minutes to count out the $5,000. And by now it's dark and it's in winter, probably January or so. And he says, okay, you got 5,000, go get them. And I turned around and walked out the sheriff's office across the road to the, to the uh, jail. And two things happened. One, there were a line of Ku Klux Klansmen in full regalia. I don't know if you ever saw how when there's a wedding at West Point, uh, how the people stand, you know, yes. and, and parade in their, yes. in their uniforms so the married couple can come through. Well, that's what I had to walk through. They didn't say a word to me, but they were there in full regalia, probably. So you had your own clan uh, on a guard? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so when I'm walking, the people in the jail who knew me saw saw me coming and they started singing in, in this crystalline, these crystalline voices, a cold winter night. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And you could hear that. I mean, it was a it was a magic moment. Oh, cool. And of course, everybody came out. We had trucks to take people back to the church. And so everybody was celebrating at the church. Everybody was out of jail. And then I needed to go back to Jackson, which was due east, crossing again the Mississippi River and going to Vicksburg. And and the the, the people who were there said, you, you can't go. We can't you can't let you go at night because it's too dangerous. You're going to be followed. So the Deacons for Defense and Justice. Have you ever read about the Deacons for Defense and Justice? No, I have not. The Deacons for Defense and Justice were, were an organization, kind of like the anti clan organization, but they were peaceful and they were very big guys. They were guys that had played football at Alcorn A&M and Jackson State College. And they said, if you have to go, we're gonna guard you and we're gonna follow you all the way to the Mississippi River. So they followed me. They, they created a roadblock so nobody could continue on uh, east and gave me a 20 minute head start. At that time, there were no cell phones. And though I made it across the bridge and I went back to Jackson and went to court the next day. But the deacons for defense and justice uh, were, were terrific. And Zelma White was terrific. And here's a funny footnote. 20 years later, I'm in Boca Raton for some event. And I see at the Boca Raton, I think it's the Marriott off of 95, I see a sign that says, welcome uh, National Association uh, of Black Mayors. And I knew Zelma had become a mayor. And I walked up to uh, the woman who was taking the names of everybody. And I said, is Mayor White here, Zelma White from Tallulah? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I can't, where is he? She said, well, the meeting is just breaking up. And I walked into this big room, uh, the ballroom there where the mayors had all congregated. And as soon as I walked in, Zelma jumped up in the back of the room, Bruce, Bruce. So here we are 20 years later. He's in Boca Raton. Absolutely He's the mayor amazing. of Tulu, Louisiana. Absolutely amazing. I mean, these are interesting stories. Absolutely amazing. Uh, would you bear with us, Bruce? Uh, today I have the distinct pleasure and honor of talking to Bruce Rogo, who is indeed a legend uh, in jurisprudence. He is the foremost First Amendment attorney uh, in the United States. He's among who's who 
for trial and appellate work. And many of you know that this is indeed a pleasure for me, for the students whom I mentor, uh, for the players whom I mentor in the community and I coach. I often mention Bruce Rogo and ask you to do your research so you would know what his role was in improving the lives of minorities in, in the South. And so today that thrill has now come through and I hope you're enjoying and we're going to pause for a station break and commercial and we'll be right back. So, last year you work around the clock to ensure that this tax season you see a return that may help you to purchase that car that you're longing for or help you to pay down that interest rate on that mortgage. Well, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result, they call that insane! You know what else is insane? All-in-one multi-tax services. All-in-one multi-tax services help you get the most of your return. Serving the 52 state nationwide. For information and direction, you can contact Marilyn Johnson at 754-204-1610. That's 754-204-1610. Or stop on by their office at 3888 West Commercial Boulevard in the city of Tamarack. All in one multi tax services LLC gives you the best of your return. It's about our advanced time for no chill time that are waste time. It's insightful, it's factual. It's Flex News and Sports Daily at 7 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. On the only station that matters, Flex, Flex FM. 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 Welcome back to uh, the Kenneth Lewis Show. Today we're talking to uh, Bruce Rogo Esquire, who, as I mentioned, is among the greatest legal minds in the United States and among one of the persons to be celebrated and honored for his role in changing the South and for protecting constitutional rights of everyone. But in particular, uh, I would like for a lot of our young people in the community to understand who Bruce Rogo is and his contributions to the civil rights movement and for making your lives better. And thanks again for being here, Bruce, and welcome back. Uh, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, Bruce, before I go on to just ask you about some of the great cases in which you have been involved is I know the work that you've done in the past, and then we'll, then, then, then we'll move on. And it's easy for me to say to people, well, you can read this um, appellate opinion, or you can take a look at this, and you can understand who he is as a, as a jurist. In, in fact, I remember when I was in law school, I did two things, and I don't know if you remember me hounding you about when you were going to have a trial, and that was because somebody had told me, you need to do the following. You need to see Bruce Rogo do a cross-examination, and you need to see Willie Gary do a closing argument. And when that person told me that going to law school, I decided, well, I don't, I'm going to ask Professor Rogo as many times as I feel necessary, when is he having a, a trial so that I can observe him do a cross-examination? So it's easy for me to tell people about how magnificent you are as an attorney, but I wanted to ask an equally important question. Certainly black people have the immutable characteristic of being black. And you grew up in Miami, you uh, a, G a young Jewish um, attorney, and certainly you understand the law and respect the law, but what motivated you? What's that thing that was within that says, Bruce Rogo, make a difference in this world so that the lives of other people would be better? I was a in law school, I was a desk clerk at the University Inn Motel in, uh, in Gainesville. And it was the nicest motel in town. Uh, it was a good job because I could study uh, when, when there was no business. And they had a buffet at where I could eat three meals a day and not have to pay. And because there's a lot of downtime, I had a fellow that was the, the bellboy there named Bracky Rice. Uh, so I was, what was I, 21, 22, Bracky was probably 17 or 18, and uh, he and I would talk all the time. And at that time, there was only one black law student at the university. 
uh, George Allen, who's since passed away. And I remember in class, the white professor, especially one professor, would say, Mr. Rogo, Mr. Smith, Mr. Lewis. But when he came to, to uh, George Allen, he used George's first name, which he didn't use as, as his regular name. Uh, he was W. George Allen. His first name was Willie. And he would call George Allen Willie. I mean, that was absolutely shocking to me. First year in law right. school and to hear this kind of thing. Bracky Rice and I would talk all the time. And Bracky Rice then invited me one afternoon to go to the NAACP meeting, which was at the Chestnut Funeral Home, the black funeral home in, uh, in Gainesville. And so in many ways, Bracky Rice uh, had a big effect on my life and introduced me to a world that I had never really seen close, been close to because growing up in Miami Beach, it was white. Uh, University of Miami was white. Uh, obviously, I, I knew that there was something wrong going on, but you know, you don't, you don't know it until you see it. Until you see uh, it. And so I saw it in law school. And then Bracky Rice introduced me to the Chestnut Funeral Home. And you, you mentioned Willie Gary. Years later, I'm flying with Willie, and there's a young fellow named Charles Chestnut who's on the plane with us. I said, are you Charles Chestnut from the Chestnut Funeral Home? He said, yes, that was my father, my grandfather. Uh, I, said, I said, do you know Bracky Rice? He said, Bracky Rice is my father's best friend. Of course oh, wow. I know him. So these connections are, are, are Come full really circle. there. <laughs> and and that, that was a motivating factor. That was a motivating factor. I'll, I'll ask you this, Bruce. I know you had a, a lawsuit against, which, which makes me laugh every time I think about this case, with Sheriff um, Purdy, who was arresting persons without um, probable cause. When you look at the situation now, and you see some of the problems that we have with overzealous um, policing, um, the fatal shootings. When you think about that case with Sheriff Purdy, we are three decades down the road. Are you satisfied that we are making progress as fast as we ought to? No, I mean, look at part, part of me just shakes my head when I see people being, quote, woke now, awakened now, yeah. organizations, businesses saying we're going to do, it's like, where have you been all this time? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I, it really, it doesn't make me angry. It, it makes me laugh at them. Uh, but, but, you know, the trouble is, is that the, this, this is like our original sin of slavery comes back and, and lives with us forever. Uh, and, and so when I watch what's happening, you know, we'll, somebody yesterday asked me about their son who's going to the police academy. I said, you know, there is a future. There is, there, there, the police will improve. The, the things will happen. People, people need the police. But, but why, it's, why it goes on like this forever, I, I don't, uh, there, there's, no, there's no excuse for it. Uh, I mean, even even the founding fathers, you know, owning slaves. I mean, it, it was not like like even back at that time. It was not like people thought that slavery was a good thing. I mean, it was it was never viewed as, as a the way thing. to treat other people. <laughs> so so uh, I, you know, you can you can have two two ways. You you can be angry, uh, or you can be hopeful. And you know, and slowly, incrementally, you see some hope. I mean, certainly. In 1964, 1965. I mean, I think things things happened in Mississippi. I mean, there are there are there was progress in Mississippi because you started from ground zero, you know, and so you can only go one way. Uh, I think the Chief Justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court at, at one point recently was black. Certainly, some of the justices. So you know, change happens, but but there's no excuse for it. No excuse for people all of a sudden waking up. No excuse to have to have people killed you know, and watch the death on video uh, and then to say, oh my God, this is terrible, it shouldn't happen. I, 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 don't, I don't know why that uh, has to be something that wakes people up. Where were you all this time? I agree. Why were we in such slumber and stupor? And, and there's something else that about which I've been curious. I mean, you are the preeminent legal mind with respect to First Amendment issues. Has anyone ever, whether from the NFL, whether from uh, government entities, 
um, contacted you uh, when Colin Kaepernick started this protest or thereafter to say, Bruce, what do you think about this within the ambit of the First Amendment and how should we approach this? Did anyone ever reach out to you? The, they, they did, but, but never in any kind of formal way. I mean, it wasn't like, like uh, people from the NFL or, you know, called me and said, you know, what, what do we have? You know, there, there are a lot of great lawyers out there and a lot of, and, and a lot of good lawyers who, who know what the law is on this and who understand how you have to approach these things. But the bottom line is it was all business. It was all business. It Absolutely. Was, you know, they're afraid if, if, if the, the people who are ticket holders, primarily white uh, ticket holders, you know, are not happy with it, then they're going to lose people. People are going to be boycotting. Now you see some courage. I mean, now, but you so, but some of the courage comes from like the NBA. I just saw that the, Milwaukee, or the, the baseball team, the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, have refused to have boycotted a game. So, but you know, this is, this is relatively recent history in terms of the whole history of the country. Uh, Jackie Robinson becomes the first black ball player. I, I actually got to meet Satchel Paige, uh, who should have been playing for years. For many years. But he never got the opportunity Josh to. Josh Gibson. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's just incredible stuff. I don't know how it gets, uh, uh, it, how people get away with it for so long. But, but, and of course, what's happened, the sports figures are very influential, no question about it. So they set a different standard, and I think that's been very helpful. But again, this is, this is 2020, this is 2020. I mean, Absolutely. I mean it, it's incredible stuff. And I think courage in corporate America uh, works, courage in sports works. Look, quite frankly, uh, soccer, which is the biggest sport in the world, in the English Premier League, they were not afraid to kneel before the games. They weren't afraid to put Black Lives Matter on the jerseys. And they weren't afraid to enact rules that would put people on ban lists for their conduct in stadiums or for the things that they post on Facebook about um, athletes of color. And actually, the younger generation has appreciated that so much more. And instead of losing a fan base, they've strengthened the fan bases among the young. And I thought that or sports franchises and groups here could have taken a leaf from that book because you can make a sign for social justice and still turn a profit. Oh well, yeah, and, and a bigger profit. A, a bigger, bigger profit. profit. Yeah. So I, so I wanna ask uh, Bruce about, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Uh, and I'm curious because you've had the best stories of all time. I mean, you're, you're, the, the stories that you've been able to share have just been tremendous. And how did you become uh, counsel for Roger Stone? Years ago, so two things happened. Years ago, Roger met me at, uh, the, at a hotel in Palm Beach after I had an argument. And he had a client who wanted to hire me. So that that's where I first met Roger Stone. And then and I did not have continuing contact with Roger Stone. Uh, but then when all this broke, two of the lawyers who were involved with him, who actually represented him when he testified to Congress and then got in trouble for that, uh, they called me. And so Roger knew who I was. And oddly enough, you know, this is how crazy it is. I mean, I represented Donald Trump. Uh, and, and I'll tell you something interesting about that. Donald, Donald Trump used to call here at this house in North Carolina, talk to my wife, always a gentleman. He would write me a note, thank you. I never saw what we've been seeing no, now with see. Donald Trump. It's like when he, when he walked down the stairs in June, whatever it was in 2015, when, when he's gonna announce and said, you know, all Mexicans are rapists. I said, I, I, I can't believe it. And I'll go back one step beyond that. When I represented the Seminoles, he called and he wanted to meet with Chief Billy uh, because he was interested in getting involved in gaming. And, and all I saw from, from Donald Trump was what I saw on television. You know, a loud mouth, he talked a lot. And, and I knew that James Billy was very sensitive about, about his heritage. And I thought, boy, this could be a disaster. We went to Washington, we went to New York, sat in his conference room. He was engaged, he was respectful. He learned about Indian culture, learned about Seminole culture. I mean, I was amazed. So 
So I represented him in several situations, one of them dealing with a First Amendment situation, dealing with the American flag. He put at Mar-a-Lago this right. huge American flag That's up, right. The kind that That's you right. see at the used car lots. That's and right. And of course, Palm Beach, which is a very you know strange kind of place, uh, they didn't like that. And so I represented him in that. I got the thing worked out and settled. Everybody was happy. So, so he and I got along well uh, in terms of all this. And every time I saw him, he was respectful, engaged, nice. And uh, but so Roger knew that I'd represented uh, Trump too, and so I think that gave Roger some some more encouragement uh, in terms of yes. And then Roger liked the way I dressed. Roger <laughs> was very big. On, on dressing properly. In fact, he told me that my dress shirts, in which I have the the, uh, the initials over my chest, he said that if I had shown up with the initials on my shirt sleeves, he wouldn't have wanted to <laughs> He wouldn't have hire hired me. you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so that's how I got involved with Roger. And and I'll tell you, Roger, uh, there, there are a bunch of people that I've met whose public persona is very different from their private, private. persona. I mean, among them, Luther Campbell, uh, among them, Don King, uh, Trump is another one, and Roger is another one. Uh, what you see in public is not what you see in, in private. And uh, so it was fine. And, you know, and it was an interesting case, an interesting issue, and a chance to try a case. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I had a great time. I mean, it was a difficult case, no question about it. But, but he, he was cooperative. He was... He was helpful, and you know, I, I kind of stayed away from all the the, the other stuff that, uh, that that goes on surrounding him. But uh, yeah, you just focus on what the case is, just what the issues are. Try to do the best you can. It's one so, of the things I wanted to ask is whether he was a cooperative client. I've all, I've personally described him as the confluence uh, uh, between eccentricity and flamboyance. I mean, I, I don't know how else to describe the persona that I see. I remember hearing him talk about a tattoo that he had on his back of, a, of one of our former um, presidents, and I thought, he is right. eccentric indeed. Um, but a cooperative he, uh, client nonetheless? Yes, yes, he did, he did. I mean, I, I can't remember any situation in which, in which we had a, a disagreement about how it should go. Remember, you know, it's one thing being a showman, as, as he is, and like, like Campbell is, like Don King is. I mean, Trump, they all have their yeah, own specialties, right. and, and, they're, and they're good at it. Uh, but when it comes to being involved in a lawsuit, uh, they're smart enough to know that, that they can't make the decision because they don't know what happens in court. The, the, you know, one of the tricks, I think, to being a lawyer is to try to try to gauge what's going to happen before it happens. But if you've never been there before, you can't do it. Absolutely. So, uh, and these people are smart enough to know that they've, they've got to defer to somebody else's judgment who's been there, who has a sense of what's going on. So, so I think, you know, it, it, there's no question that this one though, because it was such a high profile national kind of thing, uh, surprised a lot of people. I mean, I had friends. What, what are you doing? How, how is this? In fact, a woman across the road from us up here in North Carolina said, "said I'm, I'm buying a gun. Why are you buying a gun? She told a friend of ours. Be because, because I know he represents Roger Stone and these people are going to come after us. Uh, you know, so. <laughs> uh, how, how did you feel? I mean, obviously, no attorney wants to lose on, on, on that case, but when you heard uh, the, the verdict, what were your thoughts about whether the jury had that right or wrong with respect to the merits? Well, I, I think, I think, they ha I think, you know, did they have it right? You know, there were all kinds of issues and problems. I mean, there certainly was the evidence there uh, that, that I could see how it could, a jury could go that way. So my job was to try to find some way that, that jurors would hesitate, because that's what's interesting in criminal law is this, the test is in terms of reasonable doubt, would you hesitate in the mm -hmm. most important of your affairs? And so, you know, it doesn't take a lot to get somebody to hesitate. So that's that's the kind of way you have to go. But, you know, I, I was prepared. He was prepared for uh, for that kind of that kind of verdict. And uh, but but I I don't like losing a criminal case. Nothing better than having a not guilty verdict. Uh, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. That's, 
I mean, I've that's I've had the, the 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 fortune and privilege of hearing some of your, uh, your stories about some of your 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 cases and 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 your legion to say the least in terms of the significance of the the nature of the case or the persons whom you've represented. So it's this may be a difficult one. I don't know. Um, but you even mentioned Luke and some of the other persons you've represented. And so, of all those cases, which one sticks out to Bruce Rogo as the most memorable? Well, you know, there, there are two. I have a bunch of cases in the Supreme Court where, where the client was really not that important. It was the legal issue that was important. Uh, right to counsel and misdemeanor cases, right to be brought before a judge right away, you know, right to not, not to have your, your goods uh, taken by, by the lender without an opportunity to be heard, all those kind of things. Uh, those, those kind of cases, there's not much personal uh, involvement in terms of the clients. I mean, they, they suffer the injury and so they're the named plaintiff in the case. But, but Campbell was was a special case because he is a special person, and uh, you know when when he came to see me, I don't know if you heard this story, but but Alan Jacoby, who was my student at the University of Miami, called me one day and said, "Bruce, I want to bring Two Live Crew up to see you." And I had no, I didn't know rap music, I didn't know who Two Live Crew were. I said, Alan, I knew he did entertainment law. I said, Alan, are you doing immigration law now? Are these people who, who took a raft trip from Haiti or, or a boat from Cuba? That two, that's what I thought two live crew. I had no idea what he was talking about. And so he brought Luther to my house uh, in Fort Lauderdale and brought the, the, the tape. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a C, maybe it was a CD. And uh, I met Luther, it was charming, very nice. And I listened to the music, and, and I listened to the words, and the words were harsh in some fashion. Some of the words were, were words that I knew my wife wouldn't like to hear. Uh, but there was music to it, and it was certainly artistic. And uh, he said, do you think, you think we can win? I said, even if we lose, you'll win. And he said, what kind of jive white man talk is that? Uh, I said, because if, if the government says people can't have something, everybody's going to want to have it. And of course, that's exactly what happened. That's uh, right. so, so, you know, lo losing became winning, at least the first level. And then I reversed Judge Gonzalez, who I see all the time, talk to him on Zoom. We have Zoom cocktail parties, Judge Gonzalez and I now. I mean, that was a long time ago. And, but he, he didn't like the music. He didn't. He didn't get it, and uh, and I think part of it was was that he had a grandchild, and he thought that this was not good things for young people to hear, and uh, so and then the trial, the criminal trials, of course, were interesting and and fun, but but yeah, but I, I thought we had a good time. He didn't have such a good time because you know he, his his life was on the line. Not really. Nobody was, he wasn't going to go to jail really. Or if he, you know, I don't you, think you really thought he would. You but represented two live crew, and back then the lyrics were deemed to be shocking and offensive. Uh, when you have a moment, Bruce, take a listen to Cardi B's WAP, and tell me if you make it uh -huh. through, the, <laughs> through, the, through the entire <laughs> song. <laughs> it may cause you to blush a, a few times. No, 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 as, I mean, Car Cardi B is terrific, but you know, he opened she's the terrific. door to many of these things. But, but, you know, here's, but I learned a lot. I learned about it about Sir Mix a lot. I learned about rap music. Uh, you know, that's how I met Henry Louis Gates because I brought Skip Gates down as a as an expert witness. And the nice thing about being a lawyer for me has been that I learn something all the time. Uh, and, and that, you know, the difference between being a dentist, not that I'm putting dentists down, but you're operating with the same 32 teeth. Some teeth are better than others, some mouths are nicer than others, but, but it's a limited universe. But with the law, you're learning all the time. It's a terrific opportunity to, to, to learn and learn about things you never knew about. So with the remaining three minutes that I have, Bruce, you, you know, interestingly, your name has come up a few times. I, I coach, you know, I'm, I involve with young people's lives in so, so many ways. And, you know, when we talk about the current state of affairs, when we talk about the past, when I talk about the importance of um, dealing and honoring constitutional privileges like voting, 
uh, and I had one of your former students, Tom Lynch, on, um, on, 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 on the show. I mention your name very often, and I will talk about sometimes the stories that you told me and, 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 and what those stories meant to me. And I'm happy that many of my listeners here and internationally, because the show is broadcast overseas as well, has had the opportunity to hear from you and see all that you've done. And so the question I will ask now at the end of our session is, when you retire from the practice of law, what do you want the world to remember about Bruce Rogo? Well, <laughs> besides the immaculate suits and the impeccable dresser, what do you want us to remember about Bruce Rogo? That, that I was nice, that I was nice. You know, I, I've never, I've, I've never had a lawyer lie to me. I've never had a fight with, with, with anybody. Uh, and, and I think being nice and, and being open to listen to other people uh, has, and being responsive to their, their thinking is sometimes, which is way off base, uh, is, is, is it. And, I th and the other thing is that you made a di that I made a difference, whatever the difference is. I mean, I think that's the ultimate test of whether a life is well lived, if you made a difference. And it can be a small difference in terms of just the universe of your family, of the people there, or it can be a large, uh, a large difference in terms of like Supreme Court cases, winning things that establish some principles, but making a difference uh, is it. And I think everybody has it within them, the ability to make a difference with their, with their family, with their children, a larger universe too. I, I will shock you and leave you with this about uh, two things that you said to me that have profoundly impacted me and the way I practice law and the way I actually teach law. And when I teach uh, professional responsibility and the rules that regulate the Florida bar, I quote you and, and I know you won't remember this, but late one night, you and I had a, a conversation. Um, the conversation started off by me um, wanting to poke fun and tell you I wanted to take your Viper for a, a, a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we had this incredible conversation and I asked you about what sort of things I should remember as I begin to practice. And two things you told me that were incredibly profound. You said, you can litigate aggressively without ever being aggressive. And you said this to me, if somebody asks you for the extension, why not give it to him if it's within reason? Aren't you at some point in some place in your career may need an extension from that lawyer at some point too? That was one, I've never forgotten that. And I tried to be generous with opposing counsel. And the second thing you told me that night while we were talking, you said, and with respect to ethics, don't just worry about trying to remember what all the rules say. You said there is a gut test. That's what you told me by the car. You said there's a gut test, and if something feels wrong, if you think that this would run afoul of the moral principles, then it probably is wrong, and don't do it. And I have never forgotten that, and those two things have, have, have stuck with me. And I just wanna tell you uh, while we're talking face-to-face -face, that I'm incredibly appreciative for all that you've done. Uh, I've talked to a young team, my young team, I've talked to young men in the community. I have two young engineers here who are in this room now who wanted to hear this interview and have been listening carefully to young African-American males. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for the work that you've done in changing the South and in changing the lives of others to making a better America for everyone. And secondly, just thank you for the strength of character and, and, and for the legacy. And thirdly, I know how busy you are, and I want to thank you just for making time to speak uh, with the humble Kenneth Lewis, which shows nobody is ever too minuscule for Bruce Rogo, and that is why you are who you are. And I really appreciate you, Bruce. Well, thank, thank you, and, and any time, any time. I, I enjoyed the little bit I heard uh, before I came on, and I'll enjoy more, and, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank and again, uh, this brings us to the end of the hour. This has been indeed an honor and a privilege for me just to sit and talk to 
Bruce Rogo, one of the finest jurists in America, a seminal player in civil rights, a great educator that's led thousands of young minds to the bar. We are so honored to talk to Bruce and we thank him for all his contributions to our life. Ladies and gentlemen, an applause to Bruce Rogo Esquire. Thank you, Bruce. God bless you and have a fantastic evening. Thank you, Ken. Same you to you. You take care. Good night. Good night. Well, this concludes uh, this hour of the Kenneth Lewis Show. That for me was indeed such an immense pleasure to sit and talk uh, to Bruce Rogo, who has impacted the lives of so many, influenced the lives of so many, including myself, and just his kindness and his generosity, sharing of himself and his time. We are deeply appreciative uh, for an incredible legal mind and a wonderful human being. And so for all the young men who are sitting here in the room, for all the people who are in the studio, um, for all the people who are in the other rooms, for all my young players on my team, for all my mentees who've heard me wax about Bruce Rogo, you have finally heard his voice and you have finally seen his face and he has talked about the contributions which I mentioned so often. And I'm so thankful that he made the time to do it. And so um, when you do your research, let us be mindful that there have been so many people uh, in the struggle who have helped to enrich the lives of all Americans. Bruce Rogo Esquire is one of those. And may God bless him and his family. Thank you for tuning in again. God bless you, TC. God bless Flex FM. You guys take care and have a wonderful evening and an even better week. Thank you. So, last year you work around the clock to ensure that this tax season you see a return that may help you to purchase that car that you're longing for or help you to pay down that interest rate on that mortgage. Well, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result, they call that insane! You know what else is insane? All-in-one multi-tax services. All-in-one multi-tax services help you get the most of your return. Serving the 52 state nationwide. For information and direction, you can contact Marilyn Johnson at 754-204-1610. That's 754-204-1610. Or stop on by their office at 3888 West Commercial Boulevard in the city of Tamarack. All and one multi tax services LLC gives you the best of your return. It's insightful, it's factual. It's Flex News and Sports Daily at 7 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. On the only station that matters, Flex, Flex FM. 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 Bless up, my people. This is yours, Shirley Dapadi, you know, Flex FM representative. And um, just a quick message for each and everyone out there, you know what I mean? I know these times are hard times. I know people want to go out and, you know what I mean, uh, we're not really used to the being confined and not being able to step out as we feel like it we understand these feelings and we get where you guys are coming from and we understand the stress but what i'm saying to you guys is if you don't have to work if you're not a nurse a doctor a police officer if you don't have to leave your house if your job is closed stay home don't find a reason to go on the road if you already shop and you have all your necessities stay home if your city your state or your country um, if they issued any type of warning or any type of um, lockdown, any type of curfew, obey the curfew, obey the law. We just want everybody to be safe. And of course, keep tuning into Flex FM, that's flexfm.online or Flex FM Radio on Facebook. And you can catch me here Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Don't forget, stay safe, protect yourself, mask on.
The following program contains language and scenes that some viewers might 